After months of teases, the Wyatt Six faction finally made their debut during the closing segment of the June 18th, 2024 edition of Raw. Starting with Nikki Cross, we were slowly introduced to the other members, each adorned with masks representing characters from Bray Wyatt's Firefly Funhouse. We saw the gorilla position torn apart, with blood smeared on the walls. From a production standpoint, it was one of the best produced cinematic segments ever, different from anything we've seen in the Triple H era so far. As time goes on and the story kicks into gear, many hidden details within the inbuilt lore will emerge. But that's not what we're going to discuss today. The general consensus about this angle is that while the first moment was amazing, it's all about the follow-up. Characters like these are extremely difficult to book, and their auras are quite fragile. And you don't want them to be too unstoppable either, or other superstars will become collateral damage. Take Seth Rollins, for example. During his 2019 feud with The Fiend, and following the disaster that was their Hell in a Cell match, his run as a main event babyface was so damaged beyond repair, no one thought he'd ever recover and it's considered a minor miracle that he did. On the flip side, if the unstoppable monster is then flattened, you cause fans to lose faith in the effectiveness of those who failed to vanquish that same monster. That's what Goldberg squashing the Fiend did, and it retroactively tainted the credibility of Seth Rollins, Finn Balor, The Miz, and even Daniel Bryan. Careful planning and consideration have to be made regarding the actions of the group, how they influence the show going forward, and how other wrestlers react to their actions. These fundamentals will be essential to the group succeeding. One of their first victims was Chad Gable, whose Alpha Academy stablemates walked out on him in the same episode. This came after weeks of mistreating them in his pursuit of Sami Zayn's Intercontinental Championship. This can be interpreted as the Wyatt Six taking umbrage with Chad Gable's actions and acting as a force for karmic justice. And since Chad didn't have a group to protect him, he was left vulnerable to this attack, giving him cause to seek backup and, more than likely, recruit the Creed brothers. Obviously, that's after he's fully recovered from, you know. Without being physically involved, the group has the potential to bleed into other storylines and influence events indirectly. WWE has already experimented with this type of storytelling in Bray Wyatt's final run, when it appeared that Bray's first feud was with the inner conflict within himself, and the initial Uncle Howdy character was a manifestation of this inner turmoil. It's similar to how in Silent Hill 2, the monsters you face are manifestations of protagonist James Sunderland's psyche. The rest of the roster remained uninvolved in the early days of this story until L.A. Knight got caught up in the crossfire. The man plagued by his demons and trying to keep them at bay, yet they spill out and harm others, is the type of emotional horror story they could tell with this faction. A positive sign is the reports that the overall presentation will be slightly more grounded in reality, so it's not a complete anomaly within the more work-rate, sports-based world of this era. Expect something more akin to the Baker family from Resident Evil 7, or the Tuttle Cult from True Detective Season 1. So, the supernatural elements won't be part of the presentation. I understand that there is a guilty pleasure in the cheesiness of horror elements straight out of a B-movie when they are put into wrestling, but this faction looks like it's going to be treated as a legit threat. So, it seems they're going for something more akin to the 1995 movie 7, rather than the Wicker Man with Nicolas Cage. This means you can keep the horror-style aesthetic and vibe without sacrificing the tone of the product for tone-deaf supernatural skits. After all, horror doesn't have to delve into the supernatural to unnerve and terrify an audience. Luckily, we have the perfect example. Is this Clarice? Well, hello, Clarice. The Hannibal Lecter franchise consists of horror films with a crime genre backdrop. The titular Hannibal Lecter is a mortal man with no powers. Even in the books, he is described as small. Side note. I like this detail because I can tie it back to wrestling, where small was often used as a derogatory term against wrestlers who didn't match the aesthetic expectations of what a top guy should look like. Anyway, back to my original point. 
Hannibal Lecter has the uncanny ability to get into your head, and despite being incarcerated, he can still pose a threat just by utilizing his staggering intellect. Lecter preys on insecurities and zeroes in on a person's deepest fears, allowing the series to convey horror by exploring the human condition mainly through his manipulations. He knows the best way to mentally break someone, and that is by exploiting the universal feeling of having your soul exposed. This is what made the Firefly Funhouse match at WrestleMania 36 so intriguing. John Cena's character had all his emotional defenses stripped down to the core, allowing them to be exploited. Bray Wyatt used this psychological breakdown to avenge his loss to Cena from six years earlier, a loss that Bray struggled to recover from. Hannibal Lecter is never the central villain in any of the books and films, but rather a chaotic element who adds obstacles for protagonists Will Graham and Clarice Starling. The same presentation can be applied to the Wyatt Six, an abnormality in the rigid world of Triple H's WWE, acting as a constant looming threat that lurks in the background of the primary stories. Sometimes, they influence these stories without being the central focus. After all, treating the group as an attraction will prevent overexposure and heighten the impact whenever they act, all while maintaining the specter they cast over events in the WWE bubble. Hannibal Lecter only appeared for 26 minutes in Silence of the Lambs. Darth Vader appears for just 30 minutes in the original Star Wars trilogy, yet he remains an ominous threat and the heart of the central conflict for the protagonists. Similarly, for anime fans, the main antagonist of Naoki Urasawa's monster, Johan Liebert, is only shown for 35 minutes of total screen time in a show that runs for over 23 hours. The less is more approach with these characters is essential for maintaining their mystique. Their limited screen time means they maximize every nanosecond they appear, making every moment significant. And it's not like WWE is against this approach. Brock Lesnar's part-time run was partly because Brock didn't want to work full-time upon his return in 2012, but it also helped maintain his aura and created a different energy for each of his matches. So now it's a case of who they will feud with and what the in-ring presentation will be like. That remains to be seen, but hopefully it can fit into regular WWE programming without coming across as too much of an outlier, yet not so similar that everything unique about the group just blends into the background. Personally, I want to see more of the hybrid cinematic live-action performance we saw in the debut, with heavily overproduced gimmick matches akin to Lucha Underground. And in terms of segments, some character explorations, like in the Firefly Funhouse match, could be fascinating. Imagine the imagery WWE can create with a deep dive into the subconscious of Dominic Mysterio, AJ Styles battling the fears of stepping closer to retirement, or Roman Reigns losing the one thing that defined him on his journey to becoming a megastar and questioning if he can still be that megastar without it. Whatever the case may be, it's going to lead to some interesting television.